Welcome to this recording of the ADBA webinar on Biogenic CO2 from AD, organized as part of Net Zero Week 2023. The webinar is hosted by our chairman, Chris Hun, and features the launch of our latest biogas briefing on this topic. Speakers are Vasundara Doradenia, policy analyst at ADBA, David Huron, president of the British Compressed Gases Association, Rodrigo Rivera Tinoco, Technology Manager Sustainable Gas Solutions at Pente, and Dr. Nick Primer, Policy Lead at Future Biogas. The briefing and presentations can be found on our website at www.adbioresources.org. Thank you very much for watching. What I would like to do now is uh, move over to the launch of the BioCO2 pamphlet report and Wasundara Doradenya, our policy analyst at ABBA, will be talking us through some of the highlights uh, there uh, with some of the key messages. Wasson, are you ready to take it away? Yep. Great. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I will now share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see it full screen? Yep. Awesome. Okay, so welcome everyone to the uh, launch of our fourth Biogas Insight pamphlet report um, on biogenic CO2 from AD. So some of you may have um, joined us for the launches of our previous reports of hydrogen transport and food waste, and some of you may just be um, coming across our organization for the first time. If you're here for the first time, welcome. I'm Vasundara, uh, one of the policy analysts here at ADBA. So we are a UK's uh, dedicated trade association for anaerobic digestion and bioresources. So please do look us up on LinkedIn and Twitter and visit our website if you want to know more information about us. So a bit about this sector, AD represents the most immediate and cost effective means of achieving net zero targets through BCAS, which is bioenergy, carbon capture, utilization and storage. This uh, briefing, the pamphlet report, it illustrates the role of AD in decarbonizing the atmosphere by replacing fossil natural gas and CO2 with biomethane and bio CO2. Um, so we know that the carbon emissions are increasing, causing climate change and global warming, but are all carbon equal? If you're looking at the origin of the carbon that leads to increasing CO2 emissions, one contributes to the greenhouse gas emissions, while the other, it is already in the atmosphere and is part of the carbon cycle. So how does this relate to AD? Well, organic matter contains biogenic carbon and all organic matter can be recycled through AD. That means food waste, sewage, crops, industrial residues, and drink waste, livestock waste, and even garden waste. So by processing these waste through an anaerobic digester, concentrated biogenic carbon is produced within the tank. For, um, for those of you that don't know, anaerobic digestion takes these organic waste I mentioned before and uses uh, microorganisms to break them down in the presence of no oxygen. This process produces two main products, biogas and biofertilizer. It's this biogas that is comprised of two main gases, 55% um, biomethane and 45% bio CO2. This biogas can be used to produce power or upgraded further to split into these two parts I mentioned, reducing biomethane to be used in heat or transport sectors and a stream of bio CO2, which can be either used in industry or stored. Currently uh, in the UK, there are about 133 biomethane plants with the potential to capture over 1 million tons of bio CO2. The current industrial demand is about 600,000 tons, which means there's 400,000 tons available to be stored with an additional 400,000 tons of bio CO2 to be available as forecasted by the green gas support scheme. So moving into the carbon capture and storage component, we know that to deliver net zero by 2050, simply reducing emissions is no longer sufficient. We also should capture greenhouse gases from atmosphere and permanently store them. 
an estimated 75 to 81 million tons of uh, CO2 equivalent should be removed from the atmosphere every year to deliver this um, net zero target. Looking at the AD sector's ability to deliver this target at full potential, that is, if all the um, organic waste are treated through AD, the sector can capture and store around 8.3 million tons of biogenic CO2 by 2030, which means the sector alone can contribute to 10% of the government's GGR greenhouse gas removal target for net zero. Um, while this report will go deeper into the greenhouse gas removals, I want to highlight something that happened just last week. Last 26th, the Desnes published the month anticipated outcome of the last year's uh, consultation on business models for greenhouse gas removals. Few important decisions came out of this response. One, the UK government intend to develop a negative emissions contract for different scheme to accelerate the in investment in greenhouse gas removals. And two, they are considering integrating the GGRs into UK ETS, the emissions trading scheme. So the bottom line is these government plans can significantly support businesses uh, to capitalize on carbon capture and help generate revenue by selling carbon credits in addition to selling carbon itself. Now, um, moving from the storage to the utilization part of it, what sectors are using CO2? As I've mentioned before, each year the UK uses around 600,000 tons of CO2. As we already know, a massive portion about 50 to 60% of it is used in the food and drink industry to put fish into your fizzy drinks and to keep your veggies fresh, among other examples. In addition, CO2 is also used in fire extinguishers, medical applications, um, and in the energy industry, among others. So the point here is the demand for CO2 is increasing and will continue to increase in the coming years which is why we need to um, understand the cons of the current supply and the importance of the alternative CO2 supplies like AD. So looking into um, where the current CO2 supply comes from, a significant portion of this is supplied by the manufacturing of artificial fertilizer, while the remainder coming from the bioethanol industry or imported. Here is why it's an issue that over a half of our CO2 um, supply comes from artificial fertilizer. CO2 is a byproduct of fertilizer manufacture, which is an incredibly carbon and intensive, uh, energy intensive process. Without going too deep into the science of it, here are some of the facts. Manufacturing just one ton of ammonium nitrate to be used in agriculture produces around five to nine tons of greenhouse gas emissions. And globally, the ammonia production is responsible for 1.3% of the whole human-made emissions, while using about 1.8% of world's total energy supply. That is massive. Now, let's talk the economics of it. There are two variables that primarily determine the price of CO2. First one is proximity, which means how close the user is to one of the two production plants. Some of you may know already that the trucks that typically transport CO2 return to the production sites empty. Um, this is to uh, prevent tank contamination. This doubles the mileage, doubles the fuel cost, and it doubles the labor cost needed to transport just one batch of CO2. Overall, the long distance transport of CO2 is not economical and it also leads to higher life cycle emissions. Um, the next one is the price of natural gas. As you've seen in the previous slide, high levels of natural gas are required to manufacture fertilizers. And the soaring gas prices have a massive impact on the cost of fertilizer, which in turn on the cost of CO2. Going back to the current supply, the recent gas crisis highlighted the vulnerability in the existing CO2 supply chain. Gas prices that have traditionally averaged around 50 pence per therm went up massively in the past two years with peaks as high as 540 pence per therm. While the prices are looming at 80 pence per therm at the moment, I think we can agree that we won't be seeing the low levels we did uh, previously again for quite some time. And 
adding more turmoil to this situation, in early June 2022, CF Fertilizers shut its INS manufacturing plant near the Chester in response to rising gas prices. Now, at this time, the traditional supplies of industrial CO2 are produced within the UK, coming from just two plants, Billingham and Ensus. And this is where the AD comes to the rescue. As of June, there are 120, 120 AD plants in the UK with another 13 in the sewage sector, all producing biomethane. These plants have the potential to not just cover the current need, but also to ensure the security of supply due to the decentralization and also to reduce the CO2, uh, reduce the need for CO2 to travel significant distances. You can see here in this map, the distribution across the country is significant. And um, with that, I've come to the end of my presentation, but to sum it up, there's a source of biogenic carbon out there, it's usable and it's a decentralized supply and it's ready to go. And we have biomethane plants ready and with the right upgrading, they can match the current demand. You will see some of the success stories or case studies later in the panel with more included in the report. Today, my presentation only gave you a very brief idea about what's in the report and to understand all the ins and outs of biogenic CO2 and the industry and how AD relates to the biogenic CO2 production, you will need to check the report. And that ends my presentation. So thank you. Um, and I will thank share, you. Uh, stop sharing. So. Thank you very much, Rastan. Uh, that's a good kickoff for us. Um, and we've now got an excellent um, selection of panelists to discuss some of the issues. Uh, David, are you online? This is David Horan, um, who is president of the British Compressed Gas Association. David, hi. I am here. Hello. Fantastic. Um, and uh, I don't know whether you um, uh, you do indeed have uh, some slides to show us. So why don't I uh, get out of the way and let you kick off? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just to give a bit of introduction, I am um, one of my roles is, at, is as president of British Compressed Gas Association, which is a unpaid position. British Compressed Gas Association is the trade association that is representing a lot of the CO2 manufacturers historically. Um, and I want to give a bit of background in terms of biogenic CO2 um, based on my own personal experience, which is now well into its third decade dealing with CO2. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, just as an introduction, what I want to talk through is um, a little bit of the history so what shape thinking around CO2 quality and protocols in, in re particular in regard to food grade. Um, there, there are some stand, so there are some British standards out there in terms of CO2 quality, which is really written in the 90s and industrial related. Uh, but the lot of the thinking and the use as uh, highlighted by Wesson is basically that it's used for um, food applications in the main. And that is really shaping what what's needed in terms of the cleanup that's required and the quality and safety assessments that's needed. We're gonna go on to the in, in, International Society of Beverage Technicians and Sourcing and Summary, talk about CO2 as an ingredient and then the HACCP required and what's needed in terms of sampling because this is still a, a moving and developing area in terms of um, the feedstocks that can be used and turned into CO2 for food grade. Thanks, Russell. Can we go to the next slide with Jocelyn? So first incident of notice, I've got three incidents here, was uh, 1990. I'll take you back to 1990 in Perrier, um, where, in fact, a group of scientists who were doing some analysis were using Perrier as a control sample, but they then found there was benzene traces um, in the Perrier itself, and benzene being a solvent and a carcinogen. So... Perry at first reacted to say this was a, an isolated incident, but then found that the contamination was in its waters, uh, even in Europe. Uh, and it created a major challenge for them. And for them, it meant 160 bottles, million bottles recalled over a safety incident. Now, important to say that the level of benzene there would not have been injurious to health. 
but it shows the level of impact from not having the appropriate controls and checks in place. We go to the second incident, uh, a bit closer to home, up in Scotland in 1997. Um, in that, this case, uh, it, CO2 is, de is delivered to our nuclear reactors or our advanced gas-cooled reactors, um, and they use the carbon dioxide as a reactor coolant. The problem in '97 was that they have quite high pressures in how this works, and there was a flow back from the gas pressures coolant circuit back to the storage tanks, which then went back to the tanker that was delivering CO2. That tanker then had the potential to go off with what the gas that had come back from that nuclear coolant circuit off to food grade or beverage grade applications and potentially create um, a contamination. So this created a, a major impact in terms of Scotland at the time and, and statements on the incident. And the outcome that came from that was um, there is an IGA document, which is the European Industrial Gas Association document 6818, all around prevention of carbon dioxide backfeed contamination. So it's basically making sure that if you produce CO2 and then you deliver it, you don't take contaminants back from your customer's uh, process. And there's a whole risk assessment process associated with that, which if you're involved in the CO2 distribution and supply industry, you have to take account of. We go to the third incident, which was in Belgium. And effectively here, um, half a million bottles had to be thrown away from a certain well-known fizzy drink beverage. Um, effectively, what happened was there were some taste issues that were identified within a school in Belgium. People started causing, claiming from headaches and various palpitations. The reality is probably that the levels were not really injurious or to health in terms of where it was, but there were sulfide compounds there and they were certainly above the levels that would be expected. And that created a major challenge for the beverage sector in terms of what might be present in the CO2 and what might not be. That has created a culture of far more testing and, and control. Out of the back of that came the uh, IGA and ISBT specifications, which are really looking at both a quality specification, but also a risk assessment of what could be there. And it's controlling it, controlling what might be there. So this is really what set the culture in terms of that and why there's a very cautious attitude from the food and beverage industry into adopting CO2 from new sources. And I thought it's important to understand the background to that. We'll move on to the next slide. Um, effectively, what the ISBT specification, the two sit in parallel between IGA and ISBT. They've got to take slightly different approaches in the way they do it, but the, the quality standards are the same is that you know, they recognize that CO2 could come from a variety of different feed sources. When those specifications were originally produced, coming CO2 from digesters or anaerobic digestion was not an approved source. So you would not have been able to make food grade product. That product has, situation has changed. And effectively, what they say is, is it talks about the risks and some of the topics you should consider. And this is a, just an extract of a 196 page document is really be careful about any impurities the plant can't remove, which can contaminate the final product and look at the risks that go with that. And this is where I'm going to lead forward in terms of the major concerns in terms of moving on to new new feed sources to date. CO2 from crop has been very successfully applied and that can be treated very much like a fermentation product and we know what's what's going to be there. It becomes much more complex once we move away from other feeds to other feedstocks from crop. Um, and I think too fair to say is that the sector has somewhat underestimated the amount of work that goes with that um, and there's, there's more checks that need to be done in terms of the way the processes are designed and developed. And go to the next slide. So it's not about a quality specification. Carbon dioxide is a food ingredient. It's got an E number, E290. Um, and therefore, you need to look much more closely about what the risks are associated with it. And particularly when we talk about things that could come from waste, whether that be agricultural waste or other forms of waste, then a different approach looking at the AD plant and feedstocks and controls is needed than compared to CO2 taken from crop-based plants. 
the path on crop-based plants is well traveled and well understood you need to look at the whole ad and there's a whole major risk assessment that has to sit with it so sitting and saying that our plant can hit a quality spec is not enough there's also a concern about contamination from packaging with different chemicals and, and inputs that could be transferring through there and there's also a topic in terms of animal byproduct reference regulations that are referenced in the IGA spec. Now, effectively, if you are confident in your market in the way that BSC and some of those products are managed in the supply chain, which is pretty rigorously done in a UK market, but I can't speak for other markets, then you probably don't have to worry so much, but you will have to take account of that. We move to the next stage. Anal analysis is absolutely critical. Um, basically, there are two third parts to this, one of which you do need to have online analysis. So it's really important. And there are things like the carbon scan and other units out, other units out there which will provide continuous analysis. However, it's important to understand that those online analysis, analysis equipment do not comply with the standard methodologies that are required for testing. And effectively, what you will have to do is there are a limited number of laboratories which are capable of doing the full line testing, but you have to send samples off. And, and when you first start the plant at startup, there will be multiple uh, testing required during that year. As you move to a steady state, then you'll be on to an annual test, which verifies the information you're getting from your continuous online testing. We move to the next tent. So. I think it's really important, the points I wanted to get to here is there's a big reason why the sector in terms of food and beverage is concerned because there are historical incidents of major product recalls and we talk about multi-million pound, pound impacts and also customer confidence and customer safety. CO2 is a food ingredient, so it's not just about chemical analysis. This is about a safety topic and food safety, which is why the HACCP and the risk assessments that go with that have to be carefully done. And that includes what could there be the feedstocks there? What can come into that? What, how does the digestion process work? What will that remove? And how does your downstream processes work? So things like your activated carbon, what's that removing? How are you maintaining it? How are you checking that? Are you using, for example, a membrane system, which has a major advantage of a high filtration level. So it actually creates some benefits in terms of an HACCP and would give some more reassurance perhaps and some other methodologies. But all of those things just need to be factored in. And it's not for someone to say there is a magic wand that says you can get around this. You will have to look at this very carefully for your specific plant. It's a well-trodden path. So can we make food grade CO2? Yes, we can make food grade CO2. And it's been very well proven into the sector coming from crop. There are certain feedstocks, which in my opinion, so if you have curbside waste coming, you have not got a prayer of ever making food grade product. Not because you don't think the analysis can be there, but the problem is, is the standard analysis is based on assumed feedstocks. When you move to a food for a curbside collection, you have no control over what there, so you don't know what the contaminants are. You have a whole variety of other topics in terms of what may come through. So it's in virtually impossible to see how you would ever show the controls and manage an HACCP successfully around that. That doesn't mean that waste is out when it comes to that. It means certain wastes are possible, but there is a great deal of consideration that needs to be done. And it's really important for the sector and the, um, the reputation of the sector that this is done professionally and properly. Food grade CO2 finally is much more than a one page quality specification out of 196 page document, which is the uh, ISBT spec. There's a great opportunity here for the sector, but there's also major responsibilities. Just follow those responsibilities appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I think that was a very clear um, presentation with uh, some very useful points for those who are thinking of the route to food uh, grade um, biogenic CO2. Uh, and a fantastic summary of the hoops that people have to go through in terms of the regulatory quality and a reminder too, also, I think, of the, some of the really big 
potential scandals which um historically were doing a lot of damage to some of the brand values of uh, companies like uh perrier and coca-cola and 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 obviously been fairly well seared into the um, memories of people in the sector so um let's now please turn to uh, Rodrigo Rivera Tinoco. Um, Rodrigo is the technology manager of, for sustainable gas solutions at Pentair um, and has a great case study to uh, present and to talk a bit about Pentair's role in uh, calm capture. Uh, remembering always the two potential routes one is for biogenic CO2 into food grade sale but the other would be other routes uh, potentially to storage um which are uh, ways certainly of making sure uh, that it is removed from uh, the atmosphere so um rodrigo take it away thank you very much let's see can you confirm that uh, the screen is showing properly, please? Chris? Okay, I, I, I think I saw your head saying yes. So, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity um, to mention uh, some study cases and some achievements that we have made on the recycling of CO2, biogenic, and from other sources, as you, as you mentioned, Chris. Uh, it is very interesting also on the light that has been just mentioned by the previous speaker that uh, there are a lot of things uh, to check, to handle, and risk to assess, and this is a uh, part of our DNA. Uh, the overview of the presentation will go very quickly on sustainable gas solutions, biogas upgrading, what are we doing with the CO2 to add value, and of course, to control and to meet the expectations of the market and reduce risk. In a nutshell, uh, the experience that we have in Panther, it is about 75 years of experience of handling CO2. And everything started with mainly uh, carb carbonated soft drinks, uh, beers and cider, meaning that we have been involved in uh, very controlled uh, processes from the beginning in fermentation, but we have diversified uh, throughout the years, g gaining more and more experience in how to use the proper materials, how to use the proper components, to reach the specifications, not only chemically, but also uh, assessing all the risks embedded into the systems, and of course, regulatory. We have two main um, branches in Penter, if I can say. Uh, we have Penter Halfmans in the Netherlands that has uh, a lot of quality control equipment and has been there for 75 years. And we have also Penter Union Engineering with carbon capture solution for industrial gases. So we have full packages and that include the carbon capture, but also the check of the qualities and the use, that it is something very important that has given us a lot of power on looking all, all to all these PPM levels of pollutants or undesirable compounds, and of course, how to treat them. If I have a look to uh, the reference that we have in order to dig in little by little into what are we doing now with the CO2, uh, Today, uh, we have uh, more than 1,700 CO2 plants mainly in breweries and soft drinks. Uh, so throughout these 75 years of experience, uh, they were also translated and converted into a lot of opportunities in the biogas sector. And today we have more than 80 biogas upgrading units in which we have both kinds in one that it is mainly biogas upgrading with no recovery of CO2 and the the hot seller today that it is actually the the unit that upgrades the biogas and provides also CO2 liquid for commercial purposes on the top right uh, you you see also that we have also carbon capture industrial plants that are mainly for uh, bigger facilities and for industrial gases with uh, industrial partners that we have all around and uh, just to wrap up on this slide uh, all the measuring systems and that we implement in our chain include systems that can measure uh, VOCs in the inlet of the biogas, but also quality of the CO2 as a product. This has been explained uh, uh, in the beginning of, of, the, of the meeting, 
uh, just to have a have a look on uh, all the process and all the different uh, inputs that we can have to produce biogas. And I totally agree with the previous uh, speaker. We really need to be careful on uh, how to how do we treat this, and it is not only composition, but it's also management of materials. That makes that uh, today we are mainly running uh, in the picture that you see in the middle. That it is a uh, the solution that we are offering, and is the case study that it is now um, bringing a lot of value to our customers, that it is uh, the combined solution between an upgrading system and uh, the CO2 recovery. On the top part of uh, the biocomplete unit, you will have always a pretreatment that it's adequate to remove most of the pollutants that we want to, to take out. There's also some washer technology that we implement depending, of course, on what it is uh, coming uh, with the biogas and which is the feedstock. We have the compression units, Two stage membranes and the delivery to gas to grid or CNG or liquefied natural gas. But the to today's topic it is the, the second part, that it is the, the lower part of this slide. So the CO2, it, it goes into the, the, the compression stage, that it is a 5A. Then it goes uh, to um, drying systems, some carbon systems uh, to remove any potential pollutant that still remain over there, that it would be in case B before being purified by distillation in C, D and getting finally the CO2 liquid product in A. What is very interesting over here, it is that um, the way of handling uh, the biogas from the beginning and also the use of the polymeric membranes means that all uh, the pollutants that could reach that stream are retained. That makes that uh, the secondary and tertiary treatment that we have in B and the cryogenic distillation, uh, it's just eliminating most of the pollutants and enable us to reach really, really stringent uh, specifications that are part of the case studies that I, I would like to talk to you about. This is, the, let's say, the, the most common, and uh, I appreciate that uh, it was already mentioned that ESBT, that it is not only composition. It is, it is not. So we all, of course, it can reach the, the specifications that's shown in the table. With, we follow, uh, we track the different evolutions, but we also uh, have a look into the, the different uh, directives. Uh, we had experience in the past that um, for tracking and risk assessment, it was needed to easy 1935 and MOCA certificates for uh, specific markets, which actually track and show where the risk, how to can handle them, and really to show where the potential contamination of the CO2 could come. Besides the materials and the, the process, we have experience on the multi-vessel systems and all the transportation pumping and how to handle and to avoid cross-contamination of, of uh, the material that it is stored. Uh, several of our partners that uh, I think I've seen the list that I'm very happy to see that several of the partners are here today. They have these kind of systems. And uh, we have more than 10 years uh, already building this kind of units. Now let's push it a little bit forward because what happens uh, it is that there is sometimes the fear that if we go for CO2 uh, recovery from biogas, we would uh, saturate the market and then there's not going to be a, a, any place to put it or to use it. So it's going to be a cap. Well, actually, there are several other uh, points in which we can use. We were contributors to the EBI white paper for biogenic CO2 usage. And one of the experiences that we really, really had as a case study, it is the actual use of CO2 for electronic grade. In this case, the the electronic rig requires very stringent water content and also removal of other impurities because we're in a very controlled atmosphere. And it has proven to be a very high added value for the customer. Rent, um, return on invest, investment, less than two years, uh, with a, a new way of using CO2, CO2. Now, why am I also showing this uh, part in the presentation? If we see also the move that it is intrinsically coming either to the United States or to Europe in the, in the microelectronic uh, markets, it makes sense something to, to have this kind of usage in, in the radar because CO2 can be a replacement for other gases. And of course, you need to reach very stringent specs. Second, and uh, this is the most common, 
and, and I put the reference for the Northern Light uh, specification that are uh, deviating from uh, the ISBT ones. Of course, we are keeping track on how to eliminate the pollutants, how also to handle the materials to uh, prevent any damage and corrosion. We have a specific technologies patented today that can eliminate VOCs and any other residuals as aromatics, that, as were mentioned in the case of Perrier. Uh, I mean, it is a win-win situation in which uh, we can get the technologies that properly deserve attention to remove the contaminants, but at the same time, uh, the checkoff of the materials that are used in, in the systems. Our capabilities in this kind of systems and study cases show that we can go from 0.5 to 15 tons of CO2 per hour liquefied in the industrial gases branches. And in biogas today, we are mainly in, within the range of 0.5 to 4 tons of CO2. Of course, we can do bigger. Uh, I'm just using the most common common ranges. I was also taking my time. Now, a step forward also, utilization. It, indeed, in the case of ISBT, it is uh, one thing because we are also very uh, cautious on the health of the end user. In the case of carbon capture, there are some stringent specifications regarding corrosion of pipes and bacteriological activity down the wells. Uh, but in utilization, we face the same thing. And uh, the 75 years of experience have given us a lot of advantages on how to push the CO2 obtained either from industrial gases or biogenic to convert it into uh, new fuels. Uh, the, the little um, picture that you can see on the right, it is uh, one of the IEA uh, documents in which we participate. It is an academic uh, partnership that we have in Denmark in which we're developing the, uh, the production of methanol. As Panther, we are not doing catalysts, we're not doing the full process, but we uh, support uh, our partners on the development of cleaning technologies, how to handle the CO2, how to avoid impurities that can damage the catalyst very badly and just break, break the systems. Methanol, it is not the only option that we have today on the table. We have uh, in parallel the synthetic aviation fuels that we are targeting also uh, as, a, as a usage. Besides some other you know, projects that uh, I couldn't mention over here in, in the written, but we're having a look also on how to incorporate more hydrogen. In all of these cases of utilization, we will always face the challenge with catalyst or with bacteria or any other means that are used uh, to convert the CO2 into chemicals. Uh, today, we are, are already running a pilot unit, the academics in Denmark, started already a month ago in this methanol plant, and we plan just to keep uh, boosting the three parallel activities, meaning biogenic use for ISBT, uh, the CO2 use for carbon capture and storage, and in the future, in the recycling of CO2. I, that being said, it was my last slide, and many, many thanks, and uh, I'm looking forward for all the questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. I think there's some very interesting issues there, which people will probably want to pick up in the um, Q and A. <laughs> what a very useful over overview. And our uh, last um, presentation uh, today is from Nick Primer, Dr. Nick Primer of Future Biogas, and formerly of um, of Adber indeed. And um, Nick, you are talk going to talk about the Future Biogas case study and the potential role in carbon capture and storage. Over to you. Thank you, Chris. I'll, uh, let me just share my screen. Ooh, has that worked? Can you see that? Yeah. OK, great. Uh, so hi, everyone. And uh, thanks, Adva, for inviting me onto this panel today. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm uh, Nick Primer. I'm the policy lead at Future Biogas. And today I'm going to be talking about um, our sort of new approach to carbon capture and unlocking the value of, of carbon removals and feeding that into the business model of AD. So just as a really quick bit of background uh, about Future Biogas, uh, we operate 12 plants across the UK producing uh, about 500 gigawatt hours of biomethane per year, making us one of the largest biomethane producers in the UK 
um, annually. Uh, so of those 12 plants, 11 are upgrading biogas into biomethane and injecting to the grid. And one is using the biogas within a CHP to generate electricity and power. But what I really want to talk to you about is our sort of next, uh, next steps in the, the development of, of our business. And that is looking at sort of two new aspects of AD. Firstly, it's going to be unsubsidized. So producing unsubsidized biomethane. Um, and also, as I mentioned, capturing that bio CO2 and sending it to geological storage to deliver carbon removals. And uh, yeah, and this presentation is really going to fo focus mainly on that, that second side. Um, so why do we need removals as well? So we've heard a lot from the other speakers about utilization, so capturing that CO2 and sending it for sort of secondary uh, processes. And, and those utilization pathways will eventually lead to the, the release of that CO2 back into the atmosphere, which is great. It's you know very high, highly valuable um, pathway, and it's ultimately carbon neutral because it recycles that carbon in the, in the atmosphere. But what we're looking about is removals. So taking that CO2 and putting it away, locking it away from the atmosphere. And we can see from this graph that to deliver net zero, the UK requires a significant proportion of removals. And those removals will offset the unavoidable emissions from many heavy industries. So we can't get to net zero without them. And if we look at this graph on the right, you'll see what we're doing at the moment as, as a country. So at the moment, we're, we're delivering essentially no removal, zero. And yet by 2050, so in 25 years, you know, just over 25 years time, we're going to have to scale that industry up from zero to delivering about 80 million tonnes of CO2 removals per year. So we've got to invent an entire new industry that's not happening now, but is essential for net zero. Um, and this is where AD can come in and play a really powerful role within that story. So I've, uh, I've made a bit of an animation just to make it really uh, clear, make sure everyone understands what we mean by removals. So we're gonna follow the carbon. And when you look at this green carbon, I'm talking about carbon that's already in the atmosphere and contributing to climate change. So when you grow a plant, any kind of biomass, that, that material, um, you know, that plant absorbs atmospheric carbon into the plant material. And so that plants are made of atmospheric carbon. So if you grow enough of them, you can create a feedstock for an AD plant and fill that AD plant with biogenic carbon. And then that digestion process will create two new molecules being biomethane and bio CO2. And again, the carbon in both of these molecules originated in the atmosphere. So when you burn your biomethane, you're releasing that biogenic carbon back to the atmosphere. And then when you're treating, you're using your biogenic CO2 for utilization or storage. Again, you're, you're derived, it's all derived from the atmosphere. So when you upgrade that biogas into the two components, you've got this highly, highly concentrated stream of bio CO2, which you can pipe into geological storage. Um, so the ones we're looking at, and particularly all around the UK, you've got these subsea reservoirs in the North Sea and the Irish Sea, in which you can store this gas permanently um, with very low risk of reversals or remove, you know, uh, re-release. You know, much like fossil fuels can stay in the ground for millions of years, there's no reason why this CO2 shouldn't stay in these storages for tens, hundreds of thousands of years. So you can see that overall pathway that, that, that atmospheric carbon is moving from the atmosphere and into your geological storage locked away and taking it out of the atmosphere. And then when you can compare that with your fossil industries, so the black carbon, the fossil carbon, you know, that's taking the, that carbon from reserves into the atmosphere. And so when you're looking at this removal pathway and the value of it, when you have heavy industries that cannot reduce their emissions anymore, you know, they've, they've cut as much as possible um, and they will still, they may still have some residual emissions, uh, fossil based emissions, but you, you'd be able to offset them through this removals pathway. So one ton of CO2 into the ground can be, can equal one ton of CO2 released from fossil reserves and that crediting can help offset and um, allow companies to reach net zero. 
So that is exactly what we're looking to deliver through um, our, what we're calling Project Carbon Harvest and, and these new plants. So again, it's, it's taking that um, biomass grown uh, biomass grown on farm, digesting it to produce your unsubsidized biomethane for industrial use and, and offsetting the demand for um, natural gas, so therefore reducing those emissions, and then taking that bio CO2 and sequestering it into geological storage and that that pathway can generate a carbon offset a carbon credit removals credit which can be sold to corporates to again offset those unavoidable emissions and uh, and if we look at what that sort of on the ground this is what the setup generally looks like so starting on the left you've got your sustainable farm um, so all of these plants will be 100 percent crop fed but crucially, we're approaching that crop production in a new way, in a way that works with the farm such that you can produce food and fuel. So by deploying a long, diverse crop rotation, you can produce food and fuel over a period of time. And let's say in a five year rotation, you can produce five, uh, four uh, food crops and on your fifth acting as a break crop to, to you know, disrupt take a break from traditional um, sort of cereal cultivation, you can grow something like maize, rye, barley, which would be used as a feedstock for AD. And in combination with other low carbon farming techniques, such as minimal tillage, use of cover crops, um, you know, we can get a very low carbon intensity crop. So we're, we're actually aiming for a zero carbon crop, a, a, a crop with a carbon intensity of, of zero. Or if you account for digestate spreading, so returning that organic matter back to land, you can even get a carbon negative crop where essentially the, the carbon accumulation in your soil is greater than the emissions produced from the production of that crop. So if you take that and feed it into your AD plant, and one of the, the sort of scales we're looking at will produce about 150 gigawatt hours of biomethane per year, which would be injected into the grid and feed into industrial gas users and then you've got 20,000 tonnes of CO2 ready for, C, uh, for CCS and delivering those removals. Um, so based on those three different uh, sources of revenue, you, you've got your nature-based carbon removals within the soil, you've got your geological carbon removals from bio CO2 storage, and your green gas utilization from biomethane, you can look, you need to look into how you're going to accredit and quantify those, those carbon reductions and removals. So this is what future biogas are, are sort of looking at mainly. Um, so Vera, for example, are developing a methodology to account for um, removals, you know, through this pathway. And again, once that methodology is approved, we can start delivering that that pathway and earning credits, you know, from from, from its delivery. And these credits hold a high value. So again, focusing on the removals, so this this middle column, uh, middle row, um, you know, the, these removals credits are, are fetching a high price. While the industry is comp incredibly young and there's a lot to be uh, ironed out and developed. We're already seeing that some removals credits have fetched, you know, for several hundred pounds per tonne of CO2 removed. This reflects different pathways. I mean, it hasn't been done through AD, but through direct air capture and through biochar and other, um, other techniques, you know, we're, these are the prices we're initially seeing. And as we, you know, work and develop and bring that cost of storage down, you know, this, this, revenue stream is going to be really critical to AD, in particular into bringing it off subsidy, which I'll get onto in a second. And as you can see, there are lots of buyers that are already in interested in this space. So these are your first movers that are already buying certificates. And the, these are certificates that may not have even been delivered yet. They are sort of investing in the technologies now, such they'll be first in line to, to claim the removals when uh, when they start being delivered. And as I mentioned, this, this setup is 
helping break the AED's current dependence on government support. So at the moment, a, a biomethane plant, about 70% of the income could come from tariff rates from the RHI and the Green Gas Support Scheme. You know, it's a, a business model that's dependent on the green on, on government subsidies. But as uh, Desnes have already made clear, that the Green Gas Support Scheme is going to be the very last tariff-based support mechanism available to AD. And they ultimately want to bring the industry off subsidy and you know, allow it to fit in with more market-based systems. And this makes sense. We've got plants that have been running for 10, 15 years. And so we should, as an industry, seek to break that dependence. We should be standing on our own two feet. And um, if you look at what Future Biogas's sort of business case is, is looking at, it is based on these two key products. So you've got your unsubsidized green gas, where customers are recognizing the additional value from having, you know, from being 100% additional because of it's unsubsidized and um, having that predictability in its value. So you're less vulnerable to highly volatile market for gas. Um, so, so these are really strong, uh, big value added uh, to biomethane. And then of course, you've got a big proportion from these removals credits where the high integrity permanent carbon removals are being sought after by these big companies. Um, and I should say that this removals market is really being driven by two different sides. So a much of it at the moment is being driven by the voluntary carbon market. So these are companies who have set their own carbon targets. You know, they want to achieve net zero by 2030, for example. And so they're coming up with their own plan of decarbonization and they are paying the premium for you know, unsubsidized gas to meet their own emissions targets. This, the voluntary carbon market has been sort of revolutionary. It's really driving this, this market for low carbon products. But the weakness is that there's no oversight and accountability. So this is where people, um, you know, risks of greenwashing come in as, you know, companies with uh, less robust targets may be buying low quality carbon removals and, and over claiming what they're delivering. And again, they are they are greenwashing. So what we really need is the standards behind this to really underpin the market. So government backed standards and regulation to make sure that everyone is on the same page of, as what constitutes a reduction and a removal. And this is where the compliance market come in, comes in. So the compliance market being kind of government policy such as the UK emissions trading scheme, um, which says, this is, you know, this what is what counts as an emissions and removals, and this is how you can um, uh, meet your emissions caps. So as the market grows and, and talking to government, they're looking at integrating biomethane and removals through AD into the UK ETS to sort of underpin that, that market demand. And uh, just to finish up, I also wanted to have a look at comparing removals with utilisation. So obviously we're focusing heavily on removals, but uh, one of the common questions I'm often asked is, is why focus on removals when you could be selling the bio CO2 into the utilization market? And I think it's important to consider the sources of the carbon and also the timescales we're looking at. So on the short term, in the next three years, absolutely the utilization market is far stronger. Um, for removals, the infrastructure is not ready. We're still waiting for it two to three years before CCS um, really comes online and these geological stores are open to accept bio CO2. But at the moment, we're not quite there. On the utilization side, again, as the previous panelists have discussed, yep, the market's there. And with the, um, you know, the volatile, unpredictable market for the fossil-based CO2 supply, increasingly this biogenically sourced um, carbon is, is highly sought after and attractive. But as we move to the medium term, I feel like the, uh, I predict the, this, this is going to shift. So as on the removal side, the CCS projects are going to come online and there is going to be an immediate demand for these removal certificates. So there's going to be an immediate strong demand for biogenic CO2 going to removals. 
And that is in comparison to the utilization market where a CCS technology really takes off. Every single major industrial uh, emitter could potentially fit CCS onto their exhaust pipes on, on their, their chimneys to capture that CO2 and flood the market with CO2 for reuse. So some of it will be fossil, some of it will be biogenic, but the availability of CO2 will be abundant and that will bring down the value of, of CO2. And as we've seen at the moment, there's not really much in, by means of certification to differentiate between fossil and biogenic CO2. Um, when it comes to the manufacture of food and drink, you know, they, they are focused on the quality of the CO2, not the origin of the carbon. But then absolutely in the long term, you know, when we're talking 20 years plus, we've got that huge demand for removals, which can only be delivered from biogenic resourced carbon. So, you, you know, that, that's your 80 million tonnes of CO2 removals will be required per year by 2050. So there's going to be inevitably a very high demand for this pathway. And equally, there is also going to be an incredibly high demand for biogenic CO2 with premium products. As we look to sustainable aviation fuels and niche products, you know, products that have been built on fossil carbon for the last 30 decades, they're going to find it really difficult to, to decarbonize by finding new sources of carbon. Um, you know, to create the sustainable aviation fuel needed to decarbonize aviation is, a, you know, astonishing level. So absolutely, there's going to be a, a high, high demand for biogenic carbon for utilization. So in the long term, the markets are going to both be very strong. But what we're doing at Future Biogas is focusing on this, this sort of short to medium term story and the, the critical role it will play over the next 20 years. Um, so that's all for me. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. And that's um, uh, our last presentation. We've got lots and lots of good questions, but perhaps I could just start very quickly on abusing the chairmanship by asking Nick. Um, just on the removal side, this is really crucially dependent on geography, isn't it? Um, I mean, your plant, which you are looking to feed with the Northern Lights project, is essentially reliant on a reversal of the old natural gas pipelines uh, in Teesside and Humberside. So this was these were pipelines that were landing natural gas out of traditional seal geological storage in the North Sea. You then put it back into those pipelines and you put it back under the seal, under the geological seal in the North Sea, and it stays there as long as the gas stayed there before until we decided to get it out from the... Is that right? So yeah, if, you're, if you're a plant, if you're a plant on the west side of the country or down in the southwest or down in Hampshire, what do you do? Uh, yeah, so I mean, there's a, a few a few parts to that. So firstly, the, a lot of the leading CCS projects aren't actually depleted gas fields. They're, they are saline aquifers under the, the sea. So these are new developments, um, you know, new it's not it's not like the pipeline's already there and it's a reversal um these are big projects that are you know currently being developed and being constructed and this is actually what makes the uk such a you know uh, removals in the uk such a massive opportunity for the country our ge geology around the uk is highly suitable for co2 storage most countries won't have such abundant access to co2 storage and Considering removals is not only required for the UK, but most countries will need some level of removals. There is this huge market opportunity for the UK. And it's not just in the Humber. On the west side, as you, you say, there's plants could go to high net. Down on the south, there's developments in the Solent. Uh, on the sort of southwest, there's the Severn cluster that's being developed. Um, and in these Scotland, are saline, people, these are saline aquifers, are they? Yeah, there, there are a slight, you know, different geological setups, but yeah, essentially there are these CO2 storage facilities all around the UK that will be able to accept millions of tonnes of CO2 per year. And um, yeah, the, the opportunity is there. It, I also, just one final point to add on that is while we're focusing on the Humber, um, the radius in which it makes sense to transport CO2 
to these facilities is surprisingly large. You, you could drive it over four hours across the country and it would still make sense, especially if you're powering those trucks with biomethane um, or other low carbon fuels. You know, you can you can the you can transport CO2 a surprising distance and still deliver a significant net benefit for, for carbon. Okay, thank you very much. Just I mean that suggests to me that it is therefore pretty economic. I mean, the key thing you're saying unsubsidized, and that's absolutely right, because it's reliant in the end on the carbon price in the emissions trading scheme and that is merely reflecting the externalities of mm. uh of fossil fuels so i entirely agree with that analysis although it's not always easy to explain to non-economists but can you what is the carbon price you think is necessary to allow this to be a runner in terms of producing the sort of standard internal rate of return that you would get in the sector uh, I mean, we're looking at, you know, a few hundred, three, four, maybe even 500 pounds per tonne. Um, we think that's very achievable given the what, what the carbon price really needs to be to deliver net zero. And I think as as we, um, you know, we bring in these new sources of, of removals, we're going to see an increase in, in the price of them. That's a very high carbon price, certainly in terms Absolutely. of, you know, it's a lot higher than we're getting out of the ETS on either the EU or or the UK at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But th this is it. So that's obviously the, the compliance market. And I think the it, it's not in keeping with what the industry needs or can deliver at the moment. So these prices are being fetched on the voluntary market because companies need these the removals and they're supply limited. They are very, there's not many technologies that can really do them commercially. And yeah, a lot of things are being developed at the moment. And that's why we're seeing these high prices. Great. Okay, we've got a lot of questions uh, down. I think I've slightly anticipated one of them, which was uh, the issue of costs. I don't know if any of our other of our panelists would like to add something on costs, Rodrigo is selling the kit or or David. Uh, but but the the key question from Vanita Prasad there is, what is the cost of CO two separation, purification, and transportation? Can this technology, in terms of food grade, be made to wash its face with a respectable internal rate of return, given the investment involved? Uh, what I would say, Chris, is it depends a little bit on what the long term price of CO2 is in terms of where it goes. And, and we've seen high volatility around that. Um, the other thing is there is a notable difference between retrofit and install from the get go. So it's much cheaper to install your carbon capture from the initial part. And then Rodrigo could probably comment on that better in terms of where it goes. Overall, I would say the, there appears to me to be a market for it definitively. And I think the challenge there's definitely an ongoing market for co2 and it you're absolutely right it's people have talked about it. it's not just food grade there are industrial uses there's saf that's coming as well there's a variety of things happening in a way it should be a no regrets option to put carbon dioxide recovery onto a plant now if you build an ad with recovery then then that would be the so sensible way to go the challenge maybe is how so, do you... so david when you say build it with recovery do you mean literally just with a pipe sticking out or uh, oh, in fact, more than that probably both there, there have been a lot of there have been a lot of power stations built with some, you know, <laughs> supposedly <laughs> co2 ready uh for, ready with, yes and no, it's I, basically I, not little more than a pipe with a tap on it I, I think the reality would be is that from a pragmatic point of view in one way it would be much the better to put co2 capture on now the challenge piece will always be the economic argument of what, how do you fund that for the next two or three, two, three years and can you find an end use market, et cetera. So that's going to be the balance for every each individual project. Yeah. Rodrigo, would you like to talk talk a bit about this? You're 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 selling the kit on this. So you've <laughs> you presumably got a good story. Uh yes, uh, although it's gonna be a, a as a part of the story, and I think perhaps also Nick will help me <laughs> on that one, because uh, one of the main things that we see, and 
for treating the CO2 from the biogenic source, uh, I think the business cases are coming. And in particular, when, when we saw the um, uh, events of the 2022, when the market rose, I mean, uh, we were there uh, producing, then it, it comes to logistics. Uh, the opportunity to have a, a big hub producing CO2 and then transport it, transporting it more than uh, 500 miles, I think it's going to kill a little bit of, uh, the economics on that side. Sometimes in big bulk, uh, as uh, the tankers that are going for CCS make another economic sense. So it, it, it really depends. Uh, what I can say in the technology that we sell, it is that purification and compression, it, it shows to be um, competitive enough to make business cases, then really depends on how we want to integrate this CO2 in the market and the surroundings, because logistics will have a major impact on demand. Uh, perhaps also, Nick, if I may, also because you know a little bit more on the, on the uh, downstream. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, 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 historically, the one of the big barriers to, you know, why, why haven't biomethane plants been capturing CO2 for a long time? is it was that competition with your fossil-based CO2. It was our, as an industry's inability to provide CO2 at scale, or at least that kind of en seemingly endless supply. Um, and, but now, now, you know, even it's changed even in the last year, we, we've now seen that actually the, the value of it for utilization and storage, it's there we can predict a high price for a long enough period to ensure a, a, a pretty healthy rate of return. Um, and your off-takers, they, the, the security they previously had from fossil sources just isn't there. So comparatively, our relatively secure supply, even if it's slightly lower quantity, um, is, is less of an issue. So yeah, so the, the, that's, that's the, the sort of long-term value. So, so Nick, you're talking about people prepared to take, um, you know, certificates long term. Uh, as a, as with a regular off taker in the gas market, how long term are they prepared to go? Um, it's hugely variable. Um, you know, on on the biomethane side, we we've seen ten plus years. On the removal side, wouldn't quite reach ten, just because it's still quite nascent um but yeah no certainly several years at a time and i think that's only going to increase okay i've got a question here from helen glass about risks in using perhaps another market we haven't talked about which is an interesting one because potentially very fast growing are there risks of using biogenic co2 from ad to feed into vertical farming towers given the issues explored by the speakers for food grade co2 david do you have a view on that I mean, I would say it's a bit like greenhouse growing. There's no need for it to be, I mean, crop based or food grade for greenhouse gases. So basically, when you use greenhouses, they've historically used CHPs. They've burned gas and used the offtake gas. So there's no filtration, real cleaning of that at all. So my feeling would be that you wouldn't have the same level of risk constraint, basically. You'd still need to produce to a standard and manage some risk, but you're not going to a food grade. So there's no risk of contaminants getting into the uh, the crop. Nick sits in a more agro economy piece than I do, but my experience is that certainly when it's been used for greenhouse gases, that's not been the concern. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I've got uh, some quite technical uh, ones here, but perhaps before we go to that. We should look at um, when are we expecting, I don't know, Asin, you may have some thoughts on this. When are we expecting removals to be actively used within the UK ETS? And when are they expected to be used in the EU ETS? When can we start, when can investors actually start planning and developers planning on this as a reliable uh, source of revenue as opposed to something that we're all just hoping is going to happen as soon as possible. Yeah, I can start and Nick, uh, of course, can jump in with um, more expertise. So about the UK ETS, we know that um, 
two of the consultations that came out very recently on the UK ATS development and the business models for greenhouse gas removals. Both of them are considering including carbon dioxide removal in the UK ETS, um, ETS scheme. But um, that's um, the information about that is, we are expecting more information about that at, at this time and about the timeline. Um, Nick, do you want to jump in to add more information from your side? Yeah, uh, I mean, as you say, it, it, it kind of definitely is, but the timeline's unclear. Mm -hmm. they've, they've said that they need to first um, confirm the monitoring, reporting and verification standards yes. within that. And that that's a huge task. Um, I can't in the for the UK, I can't see it happening in the next two years, you know, maybe three or four. Yeah. But, but that's just pure speculation. And on the EU, EU side, a similar time they're, they're, They've actually got a bit of a head start. So they've already started working on what they're calling the quality criteria and there's a very convoluted sort of acronym of what quality stands for but um you know that this is this is what they're already working on um yeah. on a technological side the timeline's a bit more clear so northern lights is on track to be the first ccs project to come online and that will likely be in 2000 at uh, 2026 20, 27 mm -hmm. Um, you're then seeing endurance and high net in the UK, which is similarly 27, 28, but maybe a bit brought forward with sort of more government action. And yeah. then other ones around the UK, hopefully by 2030. Yeah, just um, just remembered, we have to add to that, we have um, talked to the government, relevant authorities, relevant people in the government constant conversations about including AD and CO2 uh, carbon capture, carbon removal in the ETS. And good news is it's it's there. It's not that um, the authority is completely ignoring that, but about, as, as you said, the timelines wise, it's um, still at the speculation level. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's one other point, which is that, as Nick says, they use a bit of head on uh, this, and it would be probably setting up some quite difficult uh, situations for the UK if the EU goes ahead and uh, sets this up and the UK isn't matching it with a similar, uh, it would blow a bit of a hole in the ETS, wouldn't it, in the UK ETS? So I, I, would, have, I would anticipate the UK will have to catch up and match what the EU is doing fairly rapidly. I don't know. Do you agree with that, Nick? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think we, we need to keep up. Um, and, we're, and we're frankly already falling behind on the biomethane side as well. So this yeah. year, um, EU countries, certain EU countries can use biomethane certificates to meet their obligation. Yeah. And that's not something that's happened well, yeah. yet in the UK, but hopefully soon. No, the UK, unfortunately, looks like it's falling behind, not just on the EU side, but also the US with the Inflation mm -hmm. Reduction Act. Bruce Brown has a question here. Are there any moves being made to create bio CO2 credits? I'm not sure, Bruce, what the basis for bio CO2 credits might be in public policy terms. Um, but um, any of the panelists have any thoughts? David? No, it's still not clear to me how that will work, Nick, Chris, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question on uh let's have a quick look here um uh, any thoughts on the mineralization of bio co2 i'm not sure what that means but i'm not a technician this is from ronald ragoasha i'm kind of guessing it's something a bit like some of the technologies around with um where carbon dioxide can be added to create carbonates so there are various companies that lock co2 into various forms of concrete and related carbonate structures i mean effectively it's a co2 molecule so whatever you use with other co2s you can use this co2 for as well i think it's a question of what's the best use for those so this is effectively yes solidifying the co2 and attempting to remove it instead of storing it underground 
which was the option that Nick and Future Biogas are, are committed to finding other. Um, and there has been research on that. I'm not aware of any anything that's actually near commercialization. Are you? Yeah, there are there are commercial applications where it's been used. Um, so there are I've Ooh, done work in cement. Stone. Well, yes, basically there is. It's actually working CO two CO two into locking up and little trapping metals as well. There's work that came out of the University of Greenwich that I first worked on twenty years ago. That's commercialised now. So there are people looking at that and interested in CO2 and interested in biogenic CO2. So if people will have biogenic CO2, I'm happy to talk to them and introduce them. Yeah. So there is that's a potential other source of demand for CO2 on the on the other side and, and, and potentially another route, which presumably also is non constrained geographically. You would be able to do that pretty much anywhere, whereas obviously the 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 otherwise you will depend on either old fossil fuel reservoirs saline aquifers or other forms of special geology uh, uh, um, perhaps chris is, if i might uh, add to add a little bit more to that yes, please do. um yeah, it is uh, that uh, we got experience also on the current uh, carbonization in, in uh some projects in iceland but it is mainly on carbonic acid but Something that I also did in the past, uh, and it is quite interesting in the case of wa uh, waste incineration units, it is that you have all the solid residues that need an aging before being useful for road construction. And actually one of the uses, and that it could be also considered as carbonation, it is to put CO2 to accelerate the uh, aging of these metals before being used for road construction. And it is part of a recycling of all these materials. Yeah, great. Um, I think we've already dealt with the question. We have a question about food grade CO2, obviously needing more stringent quality control than other usage of CO2. There's presumably going eventually to be a whole range uh, of uh, requirements with the food grade, beverage grade at the most demanding end. Um, and as David, I think, very sensibly warned, possibly limited in terms of the potential uh, feedstocks into AD uh, because of the contamination uh, issues. Um, Perhaps we have... uh, to, to yeah. add to that one, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but uh, it is very interesting uh, that, of course, healthy comes first. So uh, checking that the, the CO2 room matches the specs in food grade, it is of paramount priority, uh, but it is not the most stringent from a chemical point of view. Uh, as uh, David well said, we need to assess the risk and we do it. But in the case, for example, of um, electronic grade, it is even harder because you really need to go to PPB levels of a lot of pollutants that it is from a process point of view, it's more complicated. But of course, of risk, it changes, uh, let's say, that the, the risk matrix. Uh, there's a question from uh, L. Moffat. Where can we find a copy of required controls for feedstocks, if there are such things, David? You've made the warning, but is there is it written down anywhere? I mean, there are two codes, which is the International Society of Beverage Technicians Code and the uh, IGA, which is the European Industrial Gas Association Code. You mentioned that, yeah. And I have Ashley Bailey here. Do we have a breakdown of the scale of opportunity in the UK if we factor in the HACCP approach? rightly ruling out food waste and sewage sludge well it doesn't necessarily rule them out what you have to do is look at how you would how you would process them and i think that's why i've not said that they are ruled out that's not what we, the message at all is what i've said is curbside collections specifically i see as being uncontrolled but if you have controls in place and you can understand what's there then that that doesn't mean you cannot do it Great. Um, uh, well, this is another one for you, David. You mentioned the food grade CO2 from AD of crops and the use in the food and beverage sector. Is there a future also for the bio CO2 from AD of crops and zootechnical livestock waste mixture? So yes, I think I think that's the and certainly there are as work that's been done by biocarbonics, for example, 
Um, they've already taken the work to do the assessments around uh, agri, can, agri uh, facilities using both animal waste and, and crop. Here's one that goes way above my head from Beatrice Carascoza. What about using the CO2 to produce synthetic methane through the Sabatier reaction? Rodrigo. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you, Chris. No, uh, of course, it, it is part of the, the value chain of the CO2. Uh, uh, let's uh, also see the, just the rough numbers. If we're going to go to Sabatier, that means that we will uh, start uh, asking for a little bit of hydrogen you know, to pump it a little bit, and this will uh, demand high investment. So, of course, of course, it is possible. It is just also a matter of economics. And uh, if we have the connection to the grid, it is, of course, easier to inject an additional capacity, of course, depending on the contracts that have been signed. I know that in some countries there is, there is a cap, and we need to ask permission to go beyond that cap. So it is not only uh, the technical side that will uh, will cap that part, it is also the contracts, but uh, let's have a look on the hydrogen demand. And I've got here can, uh, two probably for Nick, I think. Um, Nick, can you give more insight on the 400 farmers you're engaging with, the geographic spread and the criteria? And also, what is the... Uh, maybe this isn't you. Maybe this would be back to David. But the the the, the cost of production of food grade CO two today by AD and how much does it fluctuate? Uh, yeah. So to answer that first question, yeah, uh, we are primarily located in the east of England because we specialise in crop fed AD. We broadly align with anywhere producing crops, which is the arable heartland of East Anglia, East Midlands. Uh, uh, Lincolnshire, you know, all, all of that area. It's a huge, huge area. Um, so that's where we're focused. And in terms of what they, you know, who we supply to, um, because particularly going forwards, we have these quite stringent rules on how to grow these crops sustainably and minimize those upstream carbon uh, emissions. Uh, we're looking to enter quite long term agreements, you know, 10 year plus with farmers to grow within a particular way deploying these methods and in return we'll also offer them uh, digestate proportional to the amount of food um, feed they provide us back to the land to um you know as a way of displacing their demand for artificial fertilizer so um yeah so they're, they're the types of um farms we're looking for um and in terms of the cost of production because we're looking to inject biomethane into the grid. The upgrading process we use is the membrane separation from Pentair and Enerkey, um, from some of our plants. That process produces food grade bio-CO2 as a byproduct of that upgrading process. So the CO2 stream from our plants, our existing plants at the very least, is essentially free. You know, we, we need to install the bolt-on technology to capture that CO2 for um, storage or utilization. But the, the quality of that CO2 naturally is there from um, biomethane production. And that's what makes AD such a, a, an opportunity because the, that, that high quality concentrated CO2 stream is, is already readily available. Thanks very much, David. Did you want to pick up the second? I mean, pure, I mean, if you talked about before direct air capture, you've got less than 1% CO2 in this stream, you've got over 99% CO2, so your purification is much lower. As Nick said, it's the marginal cost of the recovery system, which, as I said, is better installed at the same time, and your power to liquefy and produce. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm afraid we're coming to the end of our allotted time. Um, the uh, We still have um, a number of other questions, but I don't know whether any of you uh, have you all got access to the list of questions? Because I'd be very happy if anybody wants to have a quick look through and see whether there are any things which, as at the end, you would like to wrap up with. But otherwise, I will uh, go for any anybody who would like to make any last remarks, please do. Um, uh, any of our panellists, Rodrigo, would you like to go first? Um, Rodrigo, okay. Yeah. Rodrigo's back. 
Uh, sorry, my laptop just went out of uh, battery. Sorry, could you repeat the question, Chris? No, we're just we're just coming to the end, Rodrigo. So it yes. was just to ask whether you wanted to make any wrap up remarks or pick up any of remaining questions in the uh, in the Q and A section. Uh, yes, perhaps I, I will take the, the the one on synthetic fuels and what to see and how to use. I, I just uh, answered also very written, but uh, there is something very important, and we see it in the biogenic uh, utilization of CO two. We really need to assess the, the business case that makes sense that the, uh, to our partner that will be utilizing the units. And we don't need to close only the eyes for one specific application. The world will change. We see it in particular with the supports in the Inflation Reduction Act, the, the Article 45Q and the 48, that there are long-term and short-term visions on how to use this besides the support. I think there's a, a room for a lot of impact on this biogenic CO2. Okay, thanks very much. Wasson, did you have any closing remarks you wanted to make? Um, yeah, we just wanted to mention that we will, uh, I've put that in the chat, but we will send the uh, pamphlet report to all of you along with the recording and the slides. The slides and the recording will be available at a later stage, but we'll follow up with the report as soon as possible. And about the questions we might not we didn't have time to answer today. We will pick the main themes and answer those questions that also um, after some time. So that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, David, would any particular questions you would like to pick up or closing remarks? Thank you for the opportunity. I think biogenic CO2 is a fantastic opportunity for the sector. I think it's really important to talk about it. If there's any questions, I haven't got specific ones on here, but basically you'll find me on LinkedIn or uh, where I can possibly put you in contact. So please reach out. You're going to be a busy man. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, David. Nick. Yeah. Uh, reiterate those points too. If there are any questions you haven't got around to, feel free to contact me uh, through my email address from Adba or um, yeah, through LinkedIn or whatever. But uh, uh, yeah, but absolutely CO2 is such a massive opportunity for the AD sector. It's just, I think it's going to play a central role in its the industry's development over the next 30 years. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, all of you on the panel uh, for presenting what I think is a very interesting subject. And I'm delighted that we're part of uh, the whole net zero week uh, because it's absolutely crucial to stress the net we are going to have a lot of human activities which are going to be continuing to emit uh, greenhouse gases uh, where we don't necessarily have technological solutions. And therefore, those areas which can go net negative are going to be particularly important. Um, and obviously, in the extreme, that could be direct air capture, but it will also be all of those technologies like biogas that can actually capture uh and reuse um uh co2 so i think this is a, a conversation we will obviously go on having um and we need to continue to monitor particularly uh the economics of it to see that it's able to meet the sort of trajectory of growth that policymakers are expecting and if it doesn't then we'll obviously need to make sure hold their feet to the fire to make sure that we're going to get the policy support necessary to do it. So thank you very much to everybody today. I'm um, uh, delighted to make this contribution from Biogas and Biomethane to Net Zero Week. Uh, and I wish you all a very good rest of the day. And thank you again to our panelists. Thank you.